London. This event is part of the Solve Climate by 2030 initiative, where colleagues and universities around the world host webinars that discuss how the climate crisis might be mitigated. Each of the more than 120 webinars will look at climate solutions from their own perspective. In our webinar today, hosted by Birkbeck College, we would like to devote the webinar to the seas around us. The oceans play an incredibly important role in mitigating climate change. They observe nearly half of the CO2 that we emit into the atmosphere, and their vast energy resources in terms of wind, waves, and tides offer an enormous potential for decarbonizing our energy system. The oceans are key for our sustainable future. In our webinar, we would like to look at how humanity engages with the seas around us with vari from various cultural and scientific perspectives across a range of questions. How can we secure our energy needs from the sea without damaging the marine environment? How will ocean, new ocean activities, what will they mean for coastal communities and their way of life? And Taking a longer view, how have the oceans shaped our culture and how has our culture affected the oceans? We have invited three speakers that will address these questions from a range of disciplinary backgrounds. Aisha Demira from RWE Renewal UK will present on the challenges to develop offshore wind without damaging marine life. Dr. James Smith from University College Cork We'll talk about coastal communities and their response to change. And my Birkbeck colleague, Richard Hamlin, uh, will explore the many physical and cultural meanings of the oceans. In terms of organization, we have asked each speaker to make about 10 minutes presentation on their respective topic. This is then followed by a panel discussion that will be chaired by my colleague, Dr. Mike Bintley. But before we move on to our presentations, I would like to play and share a short welcoming video by Dr. Ivan Goodstein from Bard College in New York. And he's the lead organizer of the Solve Climate by 2030 initiative. So let me try to share my screen and uh, I can then play the video. Okay, apologies. I just realized there has to be no sound. So let's try again with sharing my um, sharing video. Um, we tried this before and it worked before, but I'm now confident that we have sound included. So let me try again to share the, the video. Welcome to the Solve Climate Global Dialogues. You're participating in one of 125 <coughs> events held across the planet, including in almost all 50 US states, part of a global project called Solve Climate by 2030. 
My name is Evan Goodstein, and I'm an economist and director of the Graduate Programs in Sustainability at Bard College in New York, the lead organizer for Solve Climate. This last year has been difficult for everyone. As the world looks forward to recovery from COVID, we are focusing tonight on the most important question facing humanity. What can we do in this year in our regions to help solve climate change while supporting struggling communities that have faced widespread loss of life, economic disaster, and joblessness? Worldwide, from Australia to Kyrgyzstan, from Colombia to Malaysia, and from South Carolina to South Africa, Solve Climate audiences are hearing from local experts and young leaders about concrete steps that can really help nations solve climate change while creating much needed jobs and incomes for everybody. The year 2020 was one of the two hottest years in human history, bringing with it massive forest and grassland fires, record-breaking storms and hurricanes, and relentless rising seas. Solving climate is the challenge which the human species must now face. There's hope for the future. Solutions have continued to advance. This year, China committed to building a carbon neutral economy while the US rejoined the Paris Agreement. Solar, wind, and battery prices continue to fall while major car companies have been rushing to electrify the global fleet. Worldwide, movements for Black Lives Matter and Me Too are leading in bringing much delayed and urgently needed justice to the world. Time is short. We have until 2030, 10 years to solve climate. We can get a lot done in this decade. We have the solutions, but only if we focus the world on climate solutions and justice, and then do the work we have to do in our own cities and regions. For students listening, you are the leaders. Without you, the future we envision will not come. I'm asking tonight for your help. We're gonna discover powerful ideas for climate solutions and climate justice and how you can be a part of the solution. But this message must reach beyond those of us who are listening right now. Would you ask all your teachers this week in every subject to make climate a class? The teacher can assign tonight's webinars homework for the students and then afterwards have a one class period discussion. And we mean every subject from art to engineering, psychology to business, dance to chemistry. Teachers don't need to be a climate expert to lead a discussion about climate change. The Solve Climate Project has easy to use teacher's guides in nearly every subject and in three languages to help teachers make climate relevant to their class. Paul, you're muted. Creatures, species driven to extinction, a planet of environmental refugees. And yet, in many ways, this is the most exciting time to ever be alive as a human. We have the tools and networks and technologies to rewire the world with clean energy, reimagine the global food system, reinvent transportation, and regenerate forests and grasslands and be well on our way to solving climate by 2030. Tonight, we will learn how to do this in our own cities, our own towns, our own regions. Thank you for the work you will do to promote climate solutions and a just world. Well, thank you, <clears throat> even Christine, for the video and uh, apologies for the audience for our sound problems. 
Um, but uh, so we had to interrupt the video in between to switch on the sound again. Um, I would like to move on to our event today. Um, and our first speaker, I would like to welcome Aisha Dimira. Aisha is a graduate of Bergbeck's MSc in Business Strategy and the Environment. This program has been renamed to the MSc in Environment and Sustainability. Um, and we are very proud that Aisha now works as an environmental specialist for the offshore wind development team, RWE Renewables UK. <clears throat> As you might be aware, offshore wind was, uh, already is now, but will soon be even a bigger backbone of our energy system. In fact, the UK government recently announced that by the year 2030, all of Britain's household electricity shall be supplied by offshore wind turbines. But how can we do this without damaging the marine environment? Um, Aisha will, in her talk, address this issue and will reflect on this question. So without further ado, I would like to hand over the screen over to you, Aisha. Thank you very much, Paul. And I'm going to try and share my screen and see if it works. I hope you can see that. I'm just going to go into full screen mode with it and just check. Can you see my screen? Yes. Fantastic. Um, there we are. So, um, as Paul already said, I'm going to talk about offshore wind farms and the marine environment. Um, I'm going to give you a general overview of offshore wind farms and um, what the main impacts are on the marine environment and what is done by developers to reduce these impacts and also talk a bit about the positive side and also the future um, of offshore wind farms. Um, so, as you know, offshore wind farms generate clean renewable energy and help in the fight against climate change by reducing emission of greenhouse gases and also the reliance um, on supplies of coal and gas and oil. And the UK currently is the world's largest offshore wind market. You can see on this map, this is only um, England, Wales and Northern Ireland, but here you can already see how many wind farms are actually in development, construction, operation. And um, worldwide, there is also an expansion into markets such as the US, China, Taiwan, Japan, and so on. Um, currently, about 25% of the UK electricity is supplied um, by wind power. Um, and the target, um, the newest target, is that 40 gigawatts of offshore wind will be produced in 2030 for the UK. Currently, the largest offshore wind farm is Hornsea One. It has a capacity of 1.2 gigawatt um, and is supplying 1 million homes, um, which is quite a lot. Um, now, if you look at the map on this slide, um, you can see that um, there is also a lot of marine protected areas around the UK. And um, even though there is clear evidence that marine climate change uh, that climate change has a significant negative impact on the oceans and marine ecosystems, uh, renewable energy does play a key role in mitigating climate change, it still is an infrastructure that is built within a marine environment. And therefore, um, it can have um, adverse impacts, which need to be carefully considered when building an actual wind farm. Um, I'm just going to see if this works. I just lost my screen. Sorry, there we go. Um, in order to obtain permission to build an offshore wind farm, um, a developer has to go through a really long consenting process, which includes public consultation and a full environmental impact assessment. Um, this process differs slightly across countries, but um, it all has the same reason to have the smallest impact possible on, on the environment. And um, it looks at all potential impacts during construction, um, through to operation decommissioning, on all the physical, biological and human environment. There is a vast range of surveys that have to be completed um, for both actually the marine side, but also the environment, uh, the terrestrial environment, which includes the cable route and good connection. Um, marine surveys include birds, marine mammals, fish, benthic, intertidal ecology, and anything you can imagine um, that is in the sea. And it also looks at archaeology, geophysics, um, shipping, socioeconomics. Um, and with all of this data and in-depth analysis is done, um, to really get an understanding of species-specific concerns and habitats. So um, we're talking a lot about um, how positive offshore wind is for the environment, which is true by contributing to the um, fight against climate change. But the actual impacts um, mostly um, happen during construction, so quite a short time period, um, but still they're there. And the key impacts are underwater noise from foundation piling. This is impacting mostly marine mammals and fish. There's habitat disturbance, 
impact on seabirds as well, which is displacement, disturbance, and um, small collision risks. Um, and it all depends really on the project. So where is the project located? Is it in an area where sensitive species um, are during their breeding season or use it as a migration route? And because of this, um, any developer has to speak with governmental bodies and environmental stakeholders to extensively plan their own EIA and how to um, move forwards with the surveys. So as you can see, um, this slide shows you the extent of surveys that have to be done in order to build an offshore wind farm. So you start with three to five years of a baseline survey, which really looks at the entire area to understand um, what is there um, and if it's actually suitable to build an offshore wind farm there. If anything comes out that is too sensitive, let's say species that is of key concern, then the wind farm won't be built. But if they can move forward, then you have to go through pre-construction monitoring, construction monitoring, and post-construction monitoring, which can be um, up to 10 years after the wind farm is built. And it's really important um, to collect all this data to understand all of the species and habitats in the area across different seasons. Um, the good thing about the offshore wind um, industry is that it also provides a platform to um, test innovative survey technologies such as ROVs, remote sensing, aerial surveys of small aircrafts and drones. And um, if there is an impact that cannot be avoided, um, but the wind farm should still be built in that area, let's say um, because it is just one species or there are options to work around it, the developer has to agree with stakeholders on mitigation measures. And mitigation measures is um, one you can see here in this slide is um, a bubble curtain, which reduces the underwater noise that is emitted from the piling, therefore protecting marine mammals. There's also micrositing to avoid sensitive habitats and seasonal restrictions where there is no construction allowed at all. Um, we talked a lot about the um, negative impacts that construction can have, but we need to understand that construction generally is relatively short. And um, looking at a wind farm as a whole, it can have the obvious long-term benefits of um, just uh, saving the emission of greenhouse gases, but it also has a um, very interesting part to it that submerged structures can actually act as artificial reefs, providing new habitats. And they can evolve into highly biodiverse communities over the years and um, facilitate even species um, to migrate, which is called the stepping stone effect. Um, there's currently not many long-term studies on this. However, um, we know so far that structures are colonized um, by epiform communities, including mussels, corals, and crabs. Um, some fish species use the area as shelter, and top predators such as marine mammals and large fish um, really target this area for food as well, and also for shelter sometimes. When we're looking at the future, um, as you've already heard, um, offshore wind really is a promising um, technology and there is projection that offshore wind can reach 1.4 tetrawatt of capacity by 2050 worldwide. Um, but because of this, it's really important to responsibly develop wind farms and um, collaborate with research organizations, universities and shareholders and um, also involve local NGOs and communities, raise awareness um, with the local population about their coastal marine environment, and also use that data to inform them about what's out there. Um, there's already um, industry research programs such as the Carbons, Carbon Trust or JIP, which fund research together um, with developers and the government to really widen that knowledge. So um, from the impact comes actually also the need to have a lot of data and a lot of research, which is fantastic. Um, really understand our oceans better. And thank you very much. This is my presentation. I'm trying to go back to stop sharing my screen. There you go. Thank you for listening. Well, thank you, Aisha, for a fascinating talk. Um, it really makes us proud at Birkbeck to see that our graduates are actually engage in such an important field that works towards uh, climate solutions. So being trying to be part of the solution, not part of the problem. Um, our next speaker uh, is Dr. James Smith, who is a postdoctoral researcher, uh, research fellow um, in the Ports Past uh, Present Project at the University College Cork. James works at the intersection of the blue environmental, spatial and digital humanities. And he's particularly interested in the way how coastal communities respond to change. And change is on the way indeed, as we have just learned from Aisha. So welcome, James, and uh, the screen is yours. 
Hello everyone. I'm I'm just going to read from a script. So, um, but I'll I'll give you some links verbally at the end uh, for anyone who's interested in our project. Uh, so basically, um, we live in a world where technologies such as the internet, air travel, and global supply chains of goods and services available at the press of a button have warped and uh, changed our sense of distance and scale. Uh, since March 2020, we've also learned that modern amenities and infrastructures are increasingly fragile um, in, in, you know, as the sense when there's a disruption, a large scale disruption and the compression of scale afforded by infrastructures uh, is not necessarily permanent. We've learned that miracles of globalization can break down, planes can be grounded, the world can become your own neighborhood or house, and a ship can block the Suez Canal most recently, bringing the entire global flow of goods to a grinding halt. Um, at the same time, many of us have realized that small, the local and the communal can have new meaning, but we've simultaneously and often jarringly learned the shock of isolation, of being cut off from friends and families, of easily traversed borders and routes becoming inaccessible. Some of us already knew this, others had to learn, and many of the imbalances and inequalities of who could afford or had the privilege not to know were picked out in a new light by COVID, by the pandemic. Uh, in my job uh, for the Ports Past and Present project, um, which is a regional development project funded by the Island Wales uh, Cooperative Program between uh, partners in Ireland um, and in, in Wales. Uh, I found myself learning from the people that are our partners, uh, be they, you know, you know, regional government, com community residents, local businesses, etc. Um, in five port communities on both sides of the Irish Sea. Uh, Dublin Port and Ross Lair in Ireland and Holyhead, Fishguard and Pembroke Dock in Wales, all active ferry ports uh, and the five ports that have the active ferry routes across the Irish Sea. They face each other over the shared sea, connected and yet divided for centuries uh, and yet constantly navigating a maze of centres and peripheries, who's at the edge who's in the centre, the Irish Sea is a centre, the Irish Sea is an edge, depending on your perspective socially, coastal communities are peripheral or central, depending on your perspective. They've seen economic good fortune come and go, technologies and infrastructures change many times over the centuries, uh, they've lost much and yet they always change or adapt for good or ill. Uh, today, these communities are contending with the profound shock of Brexit, severing a shared region into a hard border across the Irish Sea. The flow of freight and activity on the ferry services that cross the sea has dried up due to you know, COVID. Some ports have boomed due to uh, the shift in you know, freight uh, because of Brexit, for example, while others face hard times. In many ways, the social and infrastructural disruptions of recent phenomena such as your COVID and Brexit may be a taste of what we might expect from changing climates, warming oceans, extreme weather events and encroaching coastlines, especially in social terms. Um, in, um, in the Irish Sea, there's been a movement of people between Ireland and Britain for thousands of years, journeys motivated by war, trade, religion and family often experienced as a routine part of life on our neighbouring islands. The ports on both sides of the Irish Sea know this history well. They share a history of absorbing migrant labour and have often been places of exchange between people, cultures and languages. Political borders have shifted over the centuries, but the legacy of sea travel for the ports of the Irish Sea Basin endures. The events of the last few months are the latest of many social upheavals, devastating in the present, but mitigated and adapted to by strong community organisation. So we can see as the UK reopens from lockdown in these last few days and weeks, and in you know coming days and weeks, uh, community groups and regional organisations are already scrambling to adapt and to reopen, to apply for recovery funds from uh, regional and national governments to renew and to live. Um, their success, as with all such stories, is never complete, but the will remains. 
Um, my role in the project has not been what I was expecting when I, uh, you know, entered the job, but that basically describes 2020 in general. Um, engaging with communities through Zoom has not allowed for the depth and closeness of dialogue and collaboration that we had hoped for, but once again, communities adapt. Uh, the sharing of ideas, knowledge, stories and creativity across social media um, and in new digital spaces uh, uh, across the ports has been astonishing and it's been a real privilege to watch it and participate. And my role developing our website and digital storytelling uh, formats and di the di that dimension of the project, we, have, we are developing an app and other modes of public storytelling was unexpectedly accelerated. Uh, and it's only been through the participation and enthusiasm of community members that our work's been possible at all. Uh, and although we're looking forward to getting on the ferry and crossing the Irish Sea once more as a project, uh, the work of building a lasting uh, digital community, sometimes called a community of practice in academic terms, around a set of knowledge and practices for, around coastal and tourism activities will continue. And that's one of the primary goals of our project. Um, the most important thing that my job has taught me about coastal communities and community in general, I should add I'm from a different kind of coastal community. I'm from Perth in Western Australia, which is the most isolated uh, state capital in the world and faces onto the Indian Ocean, but is part of once again of a region uh, that has for centuries been one of the most, you know, active in the world, uh, yet through a sort of imperial lens that was seen in the past as peripheral. Um, but, th but it's a different type of coastal experience. But I think beyond that, in a time of increasing climate crisis, I've seen that relationships, bonds and organisation at often an extremely small scale has a slow but steady cumulative effect. Individuals and communities must rely on local and central government, yes, and and I should say, you know, extra, you know, in, in, international organisations such as, you know, the UN and the EU and, you know, like at, at that scale of action. Uh, and many markets make or break their prosperity, freight, tourism, energy production. Uh, so, for example, Pembroke Dock, one of our, um, our ports is uh, going into this new large scale marine energy project, which will be, bring a lot of new jobs to the town. But it's another social change and upheaval. And Rossler Europort is massively growing due to re realigned Brexit related freight. Fishing is another important area that can make or break prosperity. Despite the pushing and pulling of these larger forces, communities can undertake what's often called commoning at the coasts, making decisions and taking actions about common or shared resources at a local scale to improve the futures of their communities. And they're not wholly dependent on the market or on government, but they can also make their own futures, but particularly when encouraged structurally and enabled to do so. So our role as a project, along with many of our sister projects in the Island Wales Cooperation Programme of the European Regional Development Fund, we've been brokering relationships, providing resources and bringing the richness of coastal history and life into the present. So to conclude, um, we may all be called on to make unanticipated and profound decisions together in the period that's the focus of these series of talks. 2030 will be a time when many of our current habits of living and working and consumption will have significantly altered and our current behaviour will seem bizarre often and wasteful. The best I think that anyone young or old but especially young in social terms can do to prepare is to focus on the collective agency, on shared responses at a local level to global challenges, and to offer futures for the next generation that are not atomized, instrumentalized by economics or disenfranchised by inequalities. So yeah, sure, this sounds utopian, uh, but we have to see it uh, as a start before it can work. Um, uh, there's always a discourse of the unthinkable, as it's called, before any major cultural shift in perception. An idea always starts out as seeming wildly impossible or even ridiculous, and then it can become contested, 
and then eventually it may be accepted by a majority and normalized and often that's a generational thing the people who will make this happen children and young adults and i think that believing that this this sort of change in coastal communities but also for all of us to turn to the sea and pay attention to what's going on off our coastlines even if we live in a landlocked area i believe that that's believing that change is as possible as well as desirable as the first step so that's me uh, thank you well thank you james <clears throat> thank you james um highly interesting talk really really <clears throat> really interesting and i particularly like your phrase discourse of the unsinkable so i think it's all a challenge for us to to be involved in this and and thinking about how to decarbonize <clears throat> um, our, our energy system and uh, um, uh, i'm sure we are going to pick up on this later in in our discussion our third speaker is uh, dr richard hamlin richard is a senior lecturer at Birkbeck's department of english uh, theatre and creative writing. Richard is an award-winning environmental writer as well, and uh, history and an historian. And uh, his previous works include the um, award-winning monograph *The Invention of Clouds*. And now he has just completed a new book, uh, and it's called *The Sea: The Sea, Nature, and Culture*. And that book um, explores how many the many physical and cultural meanings of the oceans. Richard, over to you. Thank you very much, Paul, and uh, thank you all for coming and listening to this. Um, I've, I've been writing about weather and climate for more than 20 years now. And like just about everybody else, I guess, I first heard about climate change as this vague future threat, with something abstract and invisible that was nevertheless on its way. But it was always in the future. It was always as a, a projected future date by which something had to be done or something was going to happen. And today it's 2030, which I realise with a bit of a shock is only nine years, uh, nine years hence. I think there's nothing wrong with my maths there, which seems incredibly current now. Uh, I mean, climate change or global warming, as it was known for years, was often visualised in the form of Kind of upward trending graphs. I'm going to take my life in my hands and try to share my PowerPoint here. Uh, is this going to work? Right, is, is this working? C can you see the slide here? No, Richard, not yet. Okay. I was too, too eager. Mm -hmm. Is is that any good? No, but if you go to if you go to share screen and you just share your desktop instead of in individual windows, normally that works quite well. So to screen one. most left version. Okay, there it is. Is, it, is that it? Yeah, that's fine. Brilliant. That was smooth and seamless change to the PowerPoint. So climate change has, has often been visualized in the form of these upward trending graphs, such as the famous Keeling curve, named after Charles David Keeling of Scripps Institution of Oceanography, who began to collect atmospheric carbon dioxide data at the Mauna Loa Observatory from 1958 onwards. Uh, and this graph is easily readable as a year on year increase in carbon dioxide. So the years go along the axis on the bottom, the parts per million of CO2 uh, and the axis on upwards on the left. So we can read this as a year on year increase in CO2 concentrations from around 315 parts per million in 1958 to its current late 2020, 21 levels of 415 parts per million. And there's this distinctive shape of this graph, this sort of saw-toothed, jagged 
sort of visual image of this uh, of this line, uh, of this steadily rising line, and the regular up and down variations that you'll see in red. That rep represents the annual greening and wintering of the northern hemisphere, a seasonal leafy uptake of atmospheric CO2 by about five parts per million every year. So this curve represents kind of undeniable instrumental evidence that the chemical makeup of our atmosphere is changing. What it doesn't tell us, of course, is what is responsible for that change. And that's the point where politics comes into the picture and complicates everything. Just because we know that something's happening doesn't mean that we can agree on how best to respond. I'm going to share another data visualization that I borrowed from Bill Gates, uh, not, not personally, but from an online talk that he gave recently about technological solutions to, to climate change. And it shows the various sources of greenhouse gas emissions by volume, and it contains some surprises, I think. At least I was surprised. And it offers a useful reminder that we as a species tend to focus on what is most immediately visible. So I was surprised by the fact in the case of aviation, for example, if you look under transportation, uh, air travel counts for only 2% of greenhouse emissions, but it's a very visible 2%. We see planes every time we look up in the sky, even during lockdown. And they are powerful symbols of global economic imbalance. You know, a study published last November showed that less than 1% of the world's population are regular flyers. And that these sky hogs, it's the flying equivalent of road hogs, are responsible for almost all aviation emissions. But those emissions are only 2% of the total. Of course, aviation doesn't happen in isolation. People travel to and from airports in cars and buses, and air travel connects to an array of other environmental stresses arriving, arising from you know, international trade or from coastal tourism and all the associated damage and disruption that comes along with those. Now, I've begun with data visualizations because in a way that's the problem with climate change. You can't see it, so you have to represent it in other ways. So increases in atmospheric greenhouse gases occur invisibly. And although they can be measured and plotted on scary looking graphs, the fact of their invisibility remains a barrier to understanding and to action. That's not the case with, say, plastics in the ocean. You don't have to visualize it because you can see it. Uh, so this famous photograph, it went, uh, went viral a couple of years ago after it was uh, photographed by a photographer named Justin Hoffman, who was snorkeling in the Indian Ocean off Indonesia. And he saw this estuary seahorse rather proudly grabbing hold of this discarded earbud, cotton bud in the sea and uh, using it as a kind of raft to move along the ocean current on. So and it's remarkable and quite disheartening really how politicized climate change has become. But it's equally remarkable how unpoliticized pollution is and remains. You know there are plenty of climate change deniers out there. But as far as I know, there are no plastics in the ocean deniers, partly because everyone can see it and partly because everybody can agree that it's a terrible thing. So this photograph went on to win Wildlife Photographer of the Year Award and has been described as the poster child for today's marine rubbish crisis. Now, ocean plastics might seem to be a side issue to atmospheric warming, perhaps even less serious, but all environmental stresses are connected in all kinds of ways. So campaigning against marine trash is, is not to take one's eye off 
the bigger issue of atmospheric warming or ocean acidification. It's all part of the same responsibility that we have as a species, the duty of a responsible stewardship of our planet and its resources. And such pollution is anyway always a byproduct of greenhouse gas emitting processes. In a way, I think thinking about greenhouse gases as a form of pollution can be helpful, especially when debating with climate change deniers. I mean, the idea of pollution, of rubbish, connects with deep ancient ideas about dirt and waste. There's a well-known definition of dirt from the science of anthropology, which defines it as matter out of place. And that's a helpful way to think about pollution more widely. Obviously in the case of marine plastics, but also in the case of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases, this is all matter out of place. The problem that our planet has is not that there's too much carbon or too much carbon dioxide, but that too much of it has been displaced into the atmosphere and into the oceans as pollution. So looking at this chart again, uh, it's clear that fossil fuels are involved in just about every aspect of our lives and that emancipating ourselves from their use is vital, but not necessarily easy. It's going to demand a range of responses from state and government level intervention in areas such as manufacturing. And you'll see on this chart that manufacturing accounts for the highest proportion of greenhouse emissions of, of all sectors, 31%. That you know, 6% of emissions globally are involved in cement manufacture. That's three times more than aviation. Um, I, I mean, it's, it's not an area, cement manufacturing, it's not an area in which individuals like us can make a meaningful decision. I mean, I can choose not to fly, but I can't choose not to interact with concrete and cement in my day-to-day -day life. I mean, engineers are working on ways of making carbon-free cement, but the technology is very unlikely to be with us by 2030. But on the non-state level, there are many meaningful actions that local and regional authorities can make, especially around areas such as transportation and energy supply, which we, we heard um, Aisha talking about earlier on. And there are also mitigating actions that individuals can take around, also around transportation, uh, and also household heating and cooling, which uh, accounts for, I mean, residential heating and cooling accounts for 4% of greenhouse emissions. That's twice uh, the level of aviation. So I was struck by something mentioned on BARD's Centre for Environmental Policy website, that local and regional policymaking can have significant influence on environmental outcomes. The website pointed out that the US state of Florida, nicknamed the Sunshine State, has very little solar power. But just across the border, Georgia is a top 10 solar state. This is not the result of unevenly distributed um, natural resources. Uh, this is the result of deliberate policy decisions. And this reminded me of an example here in Britain, which would be funny if it wasn't so depressing. It was a council planning meeting that took place in the English county of Norfolk uh, a few years ago. And during that planning meeting, two rulings were passed. One, refusing permission for a wind farm to be built on nearby coastal land. And this decision reflected strong local opposition to the building of the wind farm. And the other ruling made in the same meeting was to approve funding to restore a pair of historic windmills. The flat, windy county of Norfolk was once famous for its many windmills, and they appear in lots of 18th 19th century landscape paintings. So these old windmills used natural wind power for a variety of uses, such as grinding corn and grain or pumping water. And these heritage windmills, known as stock windmills, remain much loved 
objects in the landscape. And today, a lot of effort goes into their preservation, their conservation, often by the same local interest groups that oppose the building of new power generating wind turbines, which are basically scaled up windmills. So the argument against the new turbines is often that they are too big, they're too intrusive, that they dominate the landscape, uh, and that there are too many of them. But in the 18th and 19th centuries, there were more than 10,000 windmills in Eastern England alone. And as you can see from these, these historical paintings, they were big pieces of infrastructure. You know, they were large objects. Um, and you can really see how that they dominated the, the landscape, the rural landscape at the time. I mean, these images show that really kind of Eastern England, Eastern Southern England, and across the water in densely populated Netherlands and Northern Europe. These images show how completely windmills and water mills, the infrastructure of wind and water power dominated the rural landscapes of these uh, Northern European territories. So currently there are around, I think Aisha will uh, correct me on these figures, but currently around 8,600 onshore wind turbines in operation in the UK at the moment, plus two, two and a half thousand more offshore. Uh, I, I did have a question for Aisha about uh, turbine design. Yeah. I wondered whether it would be worth <laughs> redesigning smaller turbines on land on land to look more heritage like <laughs> if they look more like these much loved old stock windmills and everybody would want one in their village but here's an interesting thing just to end on which offers a strong note of uh, positivity that i'd like to to finish this section on two days ago uh, easter monday 2021 was Britain's greenest ever day in terms of electricity generation. So it was a combination of very sunny and windy weather on Monday. Coupled, it was a bank holiday, so there was a low demand for power. And that saw a surge in renewable power entering Britain's electricity grid. Zero carbon power sources contributed 80% of Britain's electricity on Monday. It was a record. Wind power made up 39% of their energy mix, with solar power 21%, nuclear accounting for 16 and the rest was natural gas. No coal was burnt to make electricity on Monday, the first time in British history. But it, it's extraordinary. And it's almost as though just for that day, Britain returned to the wind and water powered reality of our pre-industrial, pre-coal-powered lives of two or three hundred years ago. So I wanted to end with that amazing statistic, because 10 years ago, that would have seemed absolutely impossible. And two days ago, it became not only possible, but it actually happened, that most of Britain's electricity was generated through renewable sources. So thank you for listening. And I'm going to switch my, hopefully, stop sharing my screen and come back to reality. Thank you so much for that, Richard. Um, that's such a fascinating example uh, to pick. I mean, looking at heritage windmills and thinking about um, how those areas of uh, how those areas of culture have to engage with these uh, with these issues. Um, and I suppose one thing that came out of putting together this discussion today, as well as listening to your presentations, um, uh, everyone used the word cooperation. Everyone was thinking about the collective. Um, and the environmental commons uh, in everything that you had to say. What what role is there and, and how do we facilitate useful dialogue uh, across disciplines and across different fields of study and, and make sure that we have opportunities um, to hear from, uh, from one another? Um, what do you think? Richard, your microphone's on, so go ahead. <laughs> well, 
And I, it's funny, I was thinking in answer to um, another question, uh, which was a question we were sort of asked to think about. Um, a sort of side issue came up, which is that there are lots of ways of getting involved and lots of ways of being an activist. And there's a sort of very visible, highly adrenalized forms of activism, like joining um, Extinction Rebellion and going on protests and stopping traffic and scaling buildings and unfurling banners and, and so on, which gets a lot of attention. And, you know, it's an important part of the kind of the economy of activism. But there's a much less visible and, dare I say, boring form of activism, which is actually getting involved in local politics, getting involved in those boring planning meetings, helping with the paperwork, you know, helping decisions get made, helping policy get made. It's very invisible. It's, you know, there's no adrenaline involved. There's lots of cups of tea. And I have to say, you know, act, noisy activism isn't for everybody. And quiet activism, you know, can take the place of that. Certainly in, in my case, I'm not comfortable going on noisy demonstrations. I don't like crowds. I'm quite an introverted. That's why I became a writer in the first place. You know, so quiet behind the scenes, dogged paperwork based activism is just as important as the Extinction Rebellion form of activism and can get res make results, you know. And so, for example, you know, there are lots of local council planning meetings that have got younger, greener people on them now who are approving bids for onshore wind turbines. I mean, onshore wind energy remains controversial for lots of reasons, but it's kind of, I, I chose that example of the heritage windmills because it seemed like an irony you know the, the same planning meeting could deny new turbines to generate power wind power but at the same time give a significant sum of local money to the conservation of older forms of wind power which are no longer in use and they're purely aesthetic which is not to to belittle or ridicule the, the people in that meeting I mean, they're responding to gen, you know, genuine local sentiment. And I, and I suppose bringing in history into that mix is a way of sort of questioning the priorities, you know, that by, by complaining that wind turbines are too intrusive. Well, look at those paintings. Look how intrusive windmills were. And they're beautiful. You know, they're the much loved parts of the landscape. And, I, you know, it could be that one day Aisha's wind turbines could be, you know, much loved parts of, of the landscape as well. I don't know. They partially are already. Um, here at the coast in Sussex, there are lots of people that love the views out um, into the existing Vampion. And as you said, there are lots of young um, community members that really support it and also the local councils. Um, some of them are very supportive. And maybe just to add on um, how collaboration um, is important, um, one of the examples I gave is about research. So um, there are lots, lots of areas of research in the marine environment. Um, there's also the side of engineering and, and also um, shipping, traffic and all of this that all plays into um, renewable energy as well, because these projects are part of our um, daily life of the whole industry. Um, and and it's, it's really important to see them as a whole, not as a separate thing. And um, one of the greatest things I've experienced in my career is the collaboration with universities or um, NGOs that um, share data and we share data with them in order to get a wider picture of um, the marine environment as such. It's, it's really a good start and important. And I think from my perspective, one one thing that's starting to happen and we'll, you know, talking about a mixture of different types of stakeholders, you know, like businesses, NGOs, academics, is that the slow realignment of the research landscape to assess uh, research projects based on, say, what the European Commission, you know, define or the European Research Council calls societal challenges, you know, these grand challenges. How can academics from different disciplines be aligned around a particular topic? And part of that is actually a fundamental question about, say, how do the arts and the sciences integrate? Because historically, there's not been a particularly 
at a funding level, meaningful integration, that's starting to change now. And I think the better academics specifically can get at that and including different types of, you know, stakeholders, different types of voices in their research projects. There's this increase in oral history, community history, you know, that kind of thing. I think the better academics can get at that at a funding level, but also at a research profile, you know, at an institutional level, at a whatever consortial <laughs> level, the better they can get, the more it, the easier it will be to do these things. Yeah, and and also um, kind of local interests that appear not to, to overlap hugely often turn out to overlap hugely. So where I live in London, there's a massive focus on air quality, for example, you know, particularly out from uh, from buses, private cars and, uh, you know, and, um, and motorbikes producing huge amounts of particulates. You know, we think nine out of 10 UK towns exceed World Health Organization limits or levels for safe, breathable air. And there's a lot of on the ground opposition on in local activism against, um, you know, or, or rather for cleaner, cleaner air. And of course, that aligns perfectly with lowering emissions. Because if you move on to electric transportation or low, low carbon or even no carbon forms of transportation, then you also solve the air, or help solve the air quality issue as well. And I think often those so issues tend to get separated and put into silos. So you have some people are, are, you know, protesting about air quality and other people are protesting about climate change. And you think, well, actually, your your argument is are they're, they are tightly aligned. Mm -hmm. So let's get together and turn that into a bigger, more compelling argument. Absolutely. Um, just picking up on some things that James said, and I was thinking about what you had to say about oral history then, um, is that one of the ways in which you get people to collaborate um, uh, and act collectively with people who they don't necessarily think they have much in, in, in common with? Um, is, is it a matter of, of taking lots of disparate interests and finding the common thread um, or, or other different ways of uh, taking not taking advantage of people's self-interest, but the the areas that they that they find it easier to be enthusiastic about. It's something we've been talking about quite a lot recently in our project that, you know, when it comes to community interest, people like, I don't mean this in a cynical way, but people like stories about themselves, like people like stories about their family, their community, their, their you know, like things they didn't know about the place they live or, you know, but that there's these unexpected links like Richard was talking about between the local and the global and different sets of like we have there's all these really interesting links in our region between Pembroke Dock which is a naval originally a naval shipyard and Japan you know and the you know so there's you get these really unexpected global links through attending to the local and listening to people's stories recording them framing them and then connect them to each other there's power in that I think and that 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 there's resilience and power in that that repository of easily available information and stories about oneself and one's community is that kind of uh I was thinking as well about what Aisha had to say about um, well, I was thinking with a with a wind farm, what sort of role does international collective action have to play in the future? Do you think in in sharing energy? Uh, I'm thinking here about about Richard's example of uh, of two neighbouring states which yeah. have access to these resources, but perhaps aren't working on them, you know, in concert. Um, I think it's really important to have international collaboration. Of course, it's quite limited if you have um, one wind farm in the UK that might not be directly linked to wind farm, let's say, in uh, Japan. However, the um, knowledge you can have from and the experience you can bring over there is, is absolute key and the data also to work on. And um, there is some um, energy sharing in the EU, for example, which could be could be used potentially in the future for offshore wind. Um, but I think what's absolutely key is, is also the ports, the harbors. When you think about that some manufacturing might happen in Denmark or um, across Europe, where then a wind farm is built in the UK, I think that's where the link really happens and where um, 
a more international politics and more aligned approach is really key to facilitate that. And I suppose the approach to vaccines recently has been all about, you know, those those kinds of connections. And <clears throat> Absolutely, yeah. I mean, um, having people um, together in a ship, which is the key. People from an office of work happening on vessels, lots of people coming from abroad, that, that is um, impacted, of course. Yeah. Thank you, Asha. Richard, did you did you have a hand, hand up there? Uh, there was actually a mistake, but um, <laughs> I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm happy to witter on about, um, you know, I think, I mean, one of the things that I'd say, you know, for young activists particularly is recognising your limits, not just your potential as an individual, but also your limits as an individual. And one thing you are unlikely to be able to do is to convince, um, you know, decided climate change sceptics about, you know, the about these issues. So, I mean, one piece of advice I would offer to to sort of young activists, people getting involved in environmental um, policy in whatever form, is not don't waste your energy getting into arguments with people who who don't want to have their minds changed because it's very unlikely that you will change anybody's mind. And it's a disheartening use of your own mental resources. And there's a fantastic cartoon I remember came out a few years ago. Um, it showed a member of the audience at one of these UN climate change conferences. He was standing up to ask a question and his question was, yeah, but what if climate change turns out to be a hoax and we end up creating a cleaner, more equitable planet for nothing? <laughs> I always think of that when I'm kind of uh, faced with climate change deniers who always come to talks and to you know weather events and climate events, and in a way it's much easier to talk in terms of pollution than it is to talk in terms of because it's sort of vi it's visualizable and understandable in a way that climate change and atmospheric warming remains still quite abstract and difficult to understand and imagine. So it's, I would say always always talk in terms of the specifics and what's achievable rather than in kind of total, vague, abstract, global, um, general terms. And that's and that's why starting local, like you know, with, with James's uh, oral history stuff, it's incredibly empowering having local narratives that people can relate to and identify with rather than something incredibly vague and global like like climate change which you know we don't see we can see the the effects of it we can't actually see it happening and it's very difficult to think creatively about something that you can't see and i mean that the eco eco philosopher timothy Morton talks about hyper objects that there are things like climate change or all of the nuclear waste that's ever been produced by humanity that, that exists on a scale that is impossible to imagine or directly interact with. It exists beyond the time scale, the perception of humanity. We we make decisions that affect, like have consequences we can't even necessarily apprehend ourselves. And there's always going to be like an anxiety to that. So yeah, trying to yeah, trying to work together to um, realise that there are sort of local actions that do actually make a difference to a thing you can't really see in its entirety or you can't see it all in its entirety is asking a lot of people conceptually. Yeah, that's right. I mean, I love Timothy Morton's idea of the hyper object and climate change is, is in a way the, the best example of a hyper object. It's too big to see, too big to imagine, too big to compare to anything else. So you end up generating metaphors about climate change, which, you know, which just become metaphors and, just, you know, it just becomes a kind of uh, a linguistic construct of its own. Whereas something like that photograph of the seahorse with the cotton bud, you know, you don't need a metaphor that it stands for itself. Everybody can see what it is. It's, it's quite shocking and quite moving as well. I mean, it's a beautiful photograph, but it's beautiful in a very unsettling way. Whereas with climate change, it's, you know, there isn't a photograph like that that can stand for climate change. That that image of the seahorse 
st can stand for, you know, what we're doing to the oceans as a species. We don't have an image like that for climate change. We've got graphs, we've got, you know, data, data visualizations are plenty. And we've got things like polar bears stranded on an ice floe, but it's not the same. It's still metaphor. And it's, mm -hmm. I think, one of the problems with communicating climate change and communicating the urgency of climate change is the fact that we lack clink, clinching visual icons for it. And it's, uh, I mean, it's, I think climate change really is the only environmental risk story in which the experts are more worried than the general public. Is is the sea then sort of the perfect metaphor for the difficulty of conveying climate change? I mean, it's this it's this vast entity which you can stand on the fringes of, or you can perch on top of, and go some distance into it, but um, you you can't see all of it. You know you're connected to it. Um, it is that the the difficulty uh, um, involved in, yeah. in in communicating this? Yeah, I mean it. When I was writing the sea book, I was um, I was really thrown by the you know the green motto, act local, think global, and it's very difficult to do that at the sea's edge <laughs> because there isn't really a sense of the local. Well, as soon as you as soon as you enter the water, you you've entered a massive global system, you know. Which I mean, there isn't. It, it's it's so curious. That, I mean, there are seventy bodies of water with the sea in their title. But really, there's only one ocean, which there's only one body of water, but we divide it up. But that that sense of the local disappears. That sense of time disappears as soon as you're in the water. It's a strangely atemporal um, and a whatever the word for not being in a place in particular places. It's strangely geographically empty, the sea, and it's uh, even though it's full of things. So it is a challenge to write about and challenge to think about. But it is, um, you know, it is massively visualizable at the same time. But then at the same time, I suppose we're haunted by European, of, you know, imperial ideas of the, that the islands in like that the islands are stepping stones in this kind of void that is the ocean and we cross over it and you know we're never at home in the ocean and that the islands are these temporary respites you know in this sort of void essentially whereas i guess if you look at the perceptions of say islanded you know peoples of like oceania or of any any you know the pacific rim the sea is a completely different place and it can be a home for example that that some of these ideas about what the sea is are actually uh, a legacy of you know of you know colonial legacy and actually part of overcoming climate change is overcoming the dead hand of some of those ideas as well yeah. yeah. And maybe That's to add on, I'm oh, sorry. sorry. Um, maybe to add on this nowadays, um, when looking at offshore wind farms, because I use the word stepping stones for migrating species, but it's also a new workplace for humans. We have more people working now on the on offshore wind farms. It becomes their office, their their home. Engineers that have never been um, offshore are now climbing up in the middle of the sea, a turbine, and make it their workplace. So it's it's really becoming more and more important to have that 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 knowledge that connection to the sea and it's exciting yeah there's there's a wonderful novel came out a few years ago called doggerland by ben smith which is a novel set in the future uh, of a drowned world and the only infrastructure that's left are these enormous defunct wind turbines uh, along the along the sea coast, and the the protagonist of the novel, his his job is to go around um, cannibalizing parts from the turbines and keep the few turbines that are going mm. going. But he's never seen the place that takes the energy, and it's a it's a fantastic sort of metaphor for you know <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure what, <clears throat> but it it invokes this you know this drowned post climate change uh, seascape extraordinary verisimilitude and it's very good on turbines as well it names all the 
names all the parts. So by the end of a novel, you become a bit of a turbine engineer yourself. You could, mm -hmm. you could probably disassemble one if you uh, if you had to. Which is perhaps a good point for the future, which is that, you know, actually fiction and the imaginaries we, we write about and we read about is actually possibly one of the more potent things that someone wanting to affect the change can do is to read and to think about the, what's implied by what they're reading, you know. Paul, did you want to come in with, with some questions? You've appeared on my monitor. <laughs> No, I just stood from my camera, but I'm, I'm fascinating to, to, to listen to, to, to the discussion. And, um, what came in, in into um, in talking about the, the, the past connections to the sea, how we are changing it now. And um, if you think about the, the how the North Sea will probably be looked at in the year in 30 years time from now, which is not very long. So 2050, there are lots of very, very ambitious plans. and. I'm not quite sure. I, th I think it was Richard asking the questions: how how much our uh, wind turbines are already connected to other neighbors and uh, neighboring states. Um, and right now, we are still in the infancy of of, of conceptualizing the North Sea as a resource space, a shared space, where we are generating and becoming uh, able to. If we are sharing other resource space, so sharing the winds, wind uh, resource across different nations, so Denmark, uh, Germany, Holland, and, and the UK, of course, um, then our overall energy supply will become much more robust because we are then buffering out localized um, variability in, 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 in wind, uh, wind resource. So there, if you, it's quite fascinating to look at the real plants that are really now in place and Richard I think you uh, mentioned Doggerland and Doggerland is actually uh, quite a shallow area uh, I think it's only 20 or 30 meters deep so there, there are um, uh, real plans now by the Belgium and the Dutch um, um, government to um, construct an artificial island in, in Doggerland and use this as a kind of hub to uh, for the North Sea uh, to, to as a hub for, um, for 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 North Sea grid essentially, uh, Denmark has a plan by the by 2030. Our um, our webinar is called "Solve Climate by 2030," and you pointed out, Richard, it's only nine years left until we have met 2030. <laughs> but Denmark has an official government policy to construct again in the North Sea an energy island. So it will be an artificial island to support their um, the energy generation on the sea and also in the context of hydrogen production and so on. So what we are seeing now, and we are already quite impressed by the large infrastructure we see on the, on the oceans, on, on the seascape of our seascapes, but that's just the start. So if you factor in a couple of more decades, it will be really uh, conceptually very, very different. So it will really connect, in a sense, um, our nations, our European nations together as well by by the means of energy transport and generation and also distribution. So it's some kind of peace building mechanism by default, not that it actually was meant to be, but it will serve as this as well, um, because it just works best if we all share the common resource. And what Aisha is doing right now is um, um, if these are the early generation wind farms, which are really connected just to the next coastal state. But um, in the longer term, uh, we have to connect and uh, we have to integrate them on, on a wider regional level. Thank you, Paul. Um, I, I suppose just to, to draw some of these ideas together, we, we, we have two questions which are, are being posed to everyone participating in, in these webinars um, globally, and they're, they're quite difficult questions one way or another. Um, the first is, is this, which is what is the number one thing that you think should happen um, in uh, the local area? You can take that as broadly as you like, uh, that will make an immediate difference to climate change, um, and what do you recommend uh, to those watching this webinar that they uh, should do in order to support that? Um, Aisha, do you want to take that first? Sure. Um, I think when it comes to the local community, what to do right now 
is um, education, and I mean that on a very broad level, um, that does not only include um, starting at the very young ages, including it in schools and what to do, but also educating people about um, what we've seen in, in Richard's presentation, that it's not only travel, it's not only the electricity, it's so much more how you adjust your lifestyle. Um, that can be even your nutrition, where you purchase <clears throat> things, what you buy. Um, and, and I think that's really important to, to educate people and educate them about their local products, their local availabilities, how to make the change. I think that would be my answer to that question, yeah. Thank you very much. That's a good, that's a great answer. Uh, Richard. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm going to try to share my screen again with a, an image because um, I, I completely agree with Aisha. I mean, what, what's been very clear in lockdown uh, where I live in, in North, North East London is that the local sort of craft based mom and pop sort of operations have done really well. There's, but there's a groundswell of good feeling uh, towards these uh, these places and so you know there's a lot of kind of you know homemade low low mileage low carbon or no carbon manufacturing and um, you know production of food clothes all sorts of things has really flourished in this time and there's been there's clearly an appetite for this an appetite for rethinking the way that we use our uh, towns and cities but the, the picture I wanted to show I'm going to go for this again. Picture I want to show. It's this marvellous thing. Oh, no. Back to the boring slides. Sorry about this. So can you see this, this photograph of a lamppost in West London? So well, this is a very practical thing. But I, th I think what the main thing, particularly for urban context, is moving to a low or no car no carbon emitting forms of transportation. Um, I mentioned before this this connects not just to climate change but also to the really pressing health issue of air quality, uh, which which is a mass killer uh, in in urban areas. The World Health Organization estimates that air pollution kills. 7 million people worldwide a year. It's more than COVID. Uh, nine out of 10 people breathe air that exceeds their limits for contamination. I love this particular um, enterprise in London at the moment. So more than a thousand, I think nearly 2000 now, these historic lampposts. So I'm back to historic infrastructure. First we had windmills and now we've got old Victorian lampposts. But this fantastic scheme to convert existing Victorian and Edwardian lampposts to electric vehicle charge points. And there are, like I say, there's, there's many more than a thousand of them now already in London and there'll be many more to come. Now, of course, you know, con converting every journey one makes into a no or low carbon journey is fantastically challenging. You know, it's it's not going to be easy, but this kind of innovative, imaginative, thoughtful um, solution, I think is is something to celebrate. And, I, and I'd say, you know, for, for for people listening, what you know, what you can do to, to get involved is is to try and get involved in these kinds of schemes. These are, these are very cheap, they are very local. They're very low tech in a way. I mean, it's, it's you know, this isn't kind of grand geoengineering. This is very simple, very cheap, already existing technology. And if the if the electricity generated that's going to come through those lampposts, for example, is clean electricity from from wind turbines and from other renewable sources, so we're not simply exporting the the emissions. Of electricity generating elsewhere, then you know th that kills two birds with one stone. That that helps bring down climate and greenhouse gas emissions, but it also helps solve the the clean air crisis, which is a crisis. Health, you know, it's a global health crisis of air pollution, and um, which, I, as I said before, is, is intimately connected with uh, climate emissions and greenhouse emissions. 
So, you know, get involved where you can is is um, is what I would say. You know, where I mean, obviously, if you live in an apartment block, then having an electric car is going to be much harder. You know, as a reality. But getting involved in those boring things, those planning committees, those local movements, those you know, all that paperwork has got to be done by someone. Um, but it must be somebody you know whose heart is in the right place and whose head is in the right place. So I would say you know the, the get involved in the really boring forms forms of activism, which no one talks about and nobody celebrates and are you know, never seen, but are really really important. Because it leads to things like Victorian lampposts being converted into electric vehicle charge points, which to me is just a wonderful thing, because it brings those objects, those historic objects, into, re, into repurposed new new use, which is a, a wonderful thing. Thank you, Richard. That's, uh, I can't agree more. Same question to James. I think my my direct sort of one about that would be advocate for and use devolved local level decision making and power sharing co decision making. If you're offered it, take it. If you don't have it, ask. You know, demand it. Um, and and that that's at an individual level. I think the the closer to home decisions are made at a say in the United Kingdom at a Welsh government level, at a Scottish government, at a council level, the closer to home they're made. Um, the more responsive they are. And I think I, I, arguing for that scale, and I think it's particularly important for coastal communities, like that marine power project I mentioned um, uh, in Pembroke Dock is part funded by the um, European Regional Development Fund and the Welsh government. You know, that wouldn't be, that's like the biggest thing that's happened to that town for, for good or ill for years. And that, that's how it came about. But at the same time, you've got to pay for it. Someone's, you know, like the structural funding of the European Union is going away uh, after Brexit. And uh, it can't be like with the Erasmus Fund for student mobility going away and being replaced by the grossly inadequate Turing scheme uh, to replace it. There will be an impetus to replace the European uh, Regional Development Fund and the, um, uh, the, the sort of uh, the money that it spends at a regional level with something inferior. So arguing for adequate localised funding, I mean, the two biggest users of structural funding from 2014 to 20 were Cornwall and Wales, you know, and they coastal areas, they're going to lose that if it's not argued for. So you need money to be able to trickling down to those localised decisions in order for them to be able to happen, you know. Wonderful. Thank you very much, James. And uh, thanks to all of you. We are going to uh, call an end to proceedings for today. Um, but thank you very much, uh, Aisha. Thank you, Richard. And thank you, James. And thanks also to, to my colleague Paul for hosting the first half of, uh, of our webinar. Thank you very thank much. You. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye for now.